Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And uh, this is Shackleton the Explorer, the Antarctic uh, Explorer. So I'm going to tell you a story all about climate change, specifically abrupt climate change, and how it's actually playing out worldwide now with all of these massive heat waves around the planet, these massive wildfires, torrential rains leading to massive flooding. And a lot of this stuff is also in, in the same, same location. So it all starts, this story all starts in the, in the Arctic. The Arctic's getting to be a much darker place. It's losing the uh, sea ice. Sea ice is melting out. Dark ocean is underneath. Sea ice reflects a lot of light. Dark ocean absorbs that sunlight, heats up. Snow cover over the land. Snow, very reflective, absorb, it reflects the light back up. So that energy is not absorbed. When the snow, when there's less and less snow cover, especially in the spring, then the ground is a lot darker. You know, we have the permafrost underneath, the tundra, and uh, so it's a lot darker, it absorbs energy and uh, heats up. So the Arctic's getting a lot darker, it's absorbing a lot of energy, it's warming much faster than the rest of the planet. High Arctic, five to eight times faster warming than the rest of the planet. Now this is very important, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So basically the, you gotta look at the overall climate system a look at how the heat is distributed on the planet. We know the equator is warm, the poles are cold. Because of this temperature difference, there's air movement from the equator to the poles, and there's also ocean water movement in ocean currents. And because the Earth is rotating, there's something called the Coriolis effect, which makes objects deflect doesn't change their speed, but it changes their direction. They deflect to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So the air deflecting, it creates the jet streams. The larger the temperature difference or gradient from the equator to the Arctic, the faster the jet streams go and the more zonal they are. So the more they travel from west to east with um, minimal waves in the north and south direction, but because the Arctic is warming so much faster, the jet streams are slowing down and they're becoming wavier. So the crests of the wave travel much farther to the north and the troughs of the waves travel much farther to the south and they get stuck in place. And where the ridges get stuck in place, you have high pressure and you have a lot of, you have clear, it's clear, no, very few clouds, no storms, and this is, where we get the heat domes, if you like, these big heat domes. So these big heat domes are affecting large parts of the Northern Hemisphere now, setting all kinds of temperature records. And then one of the things that can happen is things just get so hot and so dry that there's sparks, the vegetation alight, and there's these fires and these winds are fanning the flames and these fires cause, of course, hot air rises, convection is rising air in these heat domes. That creates a low pressure at the surface and that draws in air from outside. Now, if when you have fires, you have all this additional heat source. So the convective uplift is very, very strong. So you can actually get these different um, things called pyrocumulus clouds, for example. Very, very high, almost like cumulonimbus storm clouds, but they're driven by the heat from the fire. And the ash and the smoke and the flames can travel upward and when, then they can acquire a rotation and you can get these fire nados, if you like, like, like tornadoes, essentially, um, of, of fire. Um, and uh, so right now there's, you know, some of the areas of the world that stick out for these fires are Greece, okay? Greece, they had this heat dome 
They had these massive fires, lots of casualties, towns dis completely destroyed. And then what happens is that the ash and the particles that are generated in, the, these, in these infernos actually go up into the atmosphere and these particles, these ash particles and things, they act as cloud condensation nucleus. So there's water vapor in the atmosphere. The water vapor condenses on the surface of these, of these ash particles and it forms water droplets, which basically forms clouds and get enough of them. And then you can you basically have all of this moisture up in the atmosphere. And as it rises, it, of course, you get cooling, you get more condensation, the energy is released and it, it, it powers these massive torrential rain downpours. <coughs> so a few days after the fires destroyed the towns in Greece, then you had these torrential rains causing massive flooding over the burn areas. And we've seen this in California in the past. We've seen this around the world in various places now. In California in particular, we have the city of Reading, which is under incredible um, assault. Now, this is an inland city, so the, the uh, you know, I wouldn't expect us to get the torrential rain events um, unless there's sources of moisture, unless there's atmospheric rivers or sources of moisture coming, coming to that region. So what are the, some of the um, implications of all of these, you know, these massive heat waves? And it's almost like the jet streams used to rule weather patterns. They would guide storms, they would basically carry storms from one region to another region so the storms wouldn't be stuck over one area dumping all of their rain. Now what happens is the jet streams are much slower, they're much wavier, they're much more fractured and chaotic, and they're not in charge anymore. They're not, they're not the, 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 um, the dominant factor. They're being replaced by the topography, the terrain, whether you have mountains or valleys, and uh, whether you're near bodies of water. So if you're on a coastline, or on a river, or on a lake, those things are becoming much more important to determine the type of weather events that you're going to be getting, whether you get drought, or whether you get torrential rains, or whether you get a combination of things like that. Okay, so we're turning into a world of monsoonal <coughs> activity. So, you know, it's very simple. You have, the land is going to heat up and cool down much faster than the water because the, the heat capacity of water is enormous. It stores heat, so it takes a lot of, it's a lot, takes a lot more time and energy to to change the temperature of water than to change the temperature of the air. So what we're seeing right now in our, in our summer in the Northern Hemisphere, our, our boreal summer, is we're getting the land is heating up and we're getting these heat domes over the land. That rising air draws air in from around and if you happen to be on a coastline, it'll draw marine air over the land. And that moisture laden air will then convect upwards you get the condensation and latent heat release and you get the torrential rain events. So this is basically like a connection or a fire hose connecting the oceans to the particular uh, land mass next to the oceans or, you know, a lake or a large river, for example. So we're getting these, these patterns and this is across the world. Um, you know this, this is this is happening um this is this is our new our new weather pattern our new climate system so some of the implications of course are you know human health is, is affected i mean people don't deal too much with the heat especially if they're not used to it they're not acclimatized to it so these heat waves in scandinavian countries are having a huge impact on populations because they don't have air conditioning, for example. They're not used to these heat waves, so they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to 
keep their bodies cool. So the, the heat waves are causing a lot of emotional turmoil in people. They're apart from the, the physical symptoms and the physical um, damage, um, people are, are, are psychologically affected. There, there's, there's more depression, there's more suicides. People are saying, what's going on with this crazy weather? They're not used to it. They can't deal with the heat. Um, there's, of course, crops are being devastated. Forests and grasslands and trees, whatever, whatever is growing in that region is a climate, it's growing because of the climate of that region. So these heat waves are wreaking incredible tolls on the vegetation and crops and things. And the, the vegetation is withering and it's not soaking up as much carbon dioxide. So the actual carbon, the sink for carbon dioxide is, is being much reduced because of this heat wave. The yields of food crops, of grains, of soybeans, of rice, of all of these different things is decreasing because it's not, those things aren't in growing in optimal conditions. And you know, whether an area is in drought, the crops are failing, or whether the area is under torrential rains, the crops are damaged and failing. Um, or they're hit by, you know, there's lightning which ignites them, or there's hail which damages them, and so on. So, because this seems to be a more global event than in the past, a synchronization of crop failures in China, in Europe, in the U.S., is going to cause great increases in food prices. And we're already seeing grain prices increasing on the markets. We're seeing uh, cotton um, crops being devastated. We're seeing sorghum, we're seeing soy, rice, all of these different things are under great stress and it takes a while to, to trickle through the system but you know expect large increases in food prices soon from from these events. Power stations of course you know in North America and Europe where there's lots of air conditioning um, this puts a tremendous demand on the electricity grids and it's exactly at the time when these grids are being stressed. So if we have uh, nuclear plants, they require cooling water. So they're all located on coastlines or rivers or lakes and they extract the water um, in these so-called secondary loops to cool the primary loop, the, the reactor, the radioactive material, you know, if it's a water-based reactor. So when the intake water is too warm or when it's choked with jellyfish, for example, because the water's warm and they thrive, and also in a low oxygen environment they thrive, then that can clog intakes and these reactors have to throttle down, they have to go offline. And we've seen this happening on some US reactors during heat waves that are along rivers, for example. Uh, power lines, uh, they expand in the heat, right? Materials expand when they're hotter. So the power lines sag more, they're more prone to sway in high winds and to hitting vegetation, igniting fires. Uh, the resistance of an electrical wire increases with temperature. So the, the uh, power going through, there's more omnic heating, there's more resistive heating, and that will heat the line. So these lines can actually get too hot to, to uh, function properly, and the resistance goes up, so the power losses go, down, go, go up much higher. So, so you can have uh, you know, complete failures of, of the power grid. Um, so we've got all of these, um, all of these factors are, are going on right now in our present climate system. So basically we're in a climate emergency, okay? And uh, we have to start, we have to up our game. We have to get in the game. You know, we're not really in the game. We're in a global climate emergency and we've done basically nothing to address it at the moment. Thank you for listening.